Disciple Up number 211. What is a disciple? This is Disciple Up, the Disciple Empowering Podcast, where psychology, science, the real world, sin, self, and culture meet head on, and scripture rules. If you're a follower of Christ looking to grow or looking for some biblical answers, then get ready because it's time to Disciple Up. Hey everybody, welcome to Disciple Up. This is episode number 211. Hard to believe we've gotten that far. How far will we go? Well, that's an interesting question. I guess you'll just have to hang around and find out. In the meantime, today we're going to sort of do a blast from the past, but it's also got a lot of new information in it. It is something I like to come back to occasionally because I know that the vast majority of you will never go back and listen to episode one. Nor should you because it wasn't very good. I was I was trying to get my uh get my you might say my legs back. You know, I was trying to kind of get my chops again doing audio because I hadn't done any since I had quit Christian radio. Well, not quit, but I moved and we moved on and the station sold and all that. So anyway, so I was a little rusty to put it kindly. And so in the very first episode of Disciple Up, I talked about what is a disciple. Now, I'm not just going to repeat everything that I said there. I'm going to repeat some of it, but I'm also adding new stuff to it as research goes on and you actually learn new things. I know there are many Christians out there who've never had this experience, but the truth is, if you keep studying, reading, learning, investigating, you'll actually learn new things, people. It's it's amazing. <laughs> Yes, I'm being sarcastic. Now, if uh, you are new to the podcast, welcome. If you are a returning listener, welcome, welcome to you as well. And if any of you, new or old or somewhere in between, would like to get a hold of me, the two simplest ways to do it are to either email me, louie, that's L-O-U-I-E, at discipleup.org, or you can go to the uh, Facebook page, facebook.com slash discipleup and leave your comments there. Now, the show has a website called discipleup.org, which you should also go to because not only does it have every episode of the podcast available with show notes, but it has articles that I've written. It has my column in a in a local uh, news website that I've written quite a few articles for that you might find interesting. It's got video teaching. It's got links to my books that I've self-published through Amazon, including Getting Real, which I think is it's the first book that I ever wrote, and I think it has a very important message. And sort of the big one so far, of course, is Every Day in the Spirit, my book on the Holy Spirit, which is huge and uh, will you know keep you busy reading for a while. And the links to all that stuff's available at discipleup.org, as are the show notes for this and every episode that I've ever done. Granted, some of the show notes are pretty short. Some are kind of longer. Today's show notes are actually might actually be worth reading if you find this interesting, this topic that we're going to discuss today. So let's jump into it. What is a disciple? When I d- titled um, this episode Disciple Up, I wanted to focus on discipleship. Now, the podcast obviously has grown and moved around, and, and so we cover a lot of different things here, and I talk about news, you know, that that relates to the church and all kinds of things. But it always all comes back to discipleship. And uh, since um, I recorded that first episode, I've started doing a show on the radio called Tales from the Script. Tales from the Script are me telling Bible stories. Now, this has really been good for me and kind of revolutionary in the sense that I was taking these Bible characters that I knew very well and had preached on many of them, if not most of them, or these stories in the Bible, and I was having to look at them, though, from a different perspective. I was not looking at them as you would a sermon. Okay, let's look at this. What can we learn from this? What lessons can we draw out of this? Instead, I was having to look at them from a story perspective, how to tell this story and do it well. And so, because I love history and I like researching, 
Yes, I'm one of those weirdos that actually really I love to research stuff. It's great fun if it's something you're passionate about. If it's not, then research is terrible. But doing anything that you're not passionate about is generally not a lot of fun, right? So that would make sense. So I began to do research and delve into research. And I was researching stuff that uh, – because I'd never really thought much about these things before. Like when I was doing the story of Jacob, I found out through research that we know all kinds of stuff today about what he would have been taught and how he would have been schooled and what his life as a young prince would have been like that we didn't know back when you know I was in Bible college 100 years ago. So – I began to really get into that, and just recently I'm doing the first – I'm doing stories on the first year of Jesus' ministry right now on Tales from the Script. And I was doing some research on this and found some very interesting information from the Hebrew perspectives, which was not in the first episode of this. So we're going to go through that, and then we're going to go through uh, the more New Testament Greek kind of look at things, and then we'll kind of maybe draw some conclusions. We'll see. So let's get started. And I've actually, the first part of the show notes here, the first, whatever it is, five, six, ten, the first, like, page, a little over a page, is actually part of the script from um, an episode of Disciple Up that I haven't recorded yet, but I will soon. So here we go. Jesus began, and oh, by the way, I'm going to read this, but I'm also going to do what I always do when I read stuff. I'm going to break into my own article or my own story and comment on it because... You know, that's what you do. I'm also going to be drinking Mio because it is getting warm here. Okay, so having said all that, let's go. Jesus began his first year of ministry by doing several things at once. He was traveling, teaching, and performing what the Apostle John called signs, which are better known as miracles. And in the midst of all that, he was recruiting an inner circle to follow him. This recruitment was not unusual. Nor did it make Jesus stand out from the other rabbis. In fact, it was uh, something that almost all of them did and continued to do long past the first century A.D. The Hebrew term for what it means to be a disciple is pronounced something like shumus chachamin or kakamin chachamin, probably something like that. In the context, yes, I took Hebrew, but it's been a long time. In the context of the time, this means a, quote, servant of the rabbis, unquote. Serving is essentially the first stage of discipleship. You serve your rabbi as you learn how to follow the word of God like he does. The object of discipleship is to follow, emulate, copy, duplicate, and replicate your rabbi all while serving him. According to the Babylonian Talmud, which contains teachings of uh, Jewish rabbis for hundreds of years, but it actually wasn't written down, or at least I think the earliest copy that we have is the second century AD or somewhere right around there. But according to this, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, a disciple would carry the rabbi's baggage prepare his food to his liking, and provide him with money for his needs. A disciple could not contradict his rabbi in public or rule against his rabbi in matters of the Torah. A disciple was obligated also to protect his rabbi. As you can see from just what I've read so far, Jesus gave his disciples an extraordinary latitude in allowing them to debate with him. Now, I, I've got a couple of examples here that I find really interesting. When you look at them now, knowing what you know, the, the way the disciples acted at times in the New Testament makes more sense. John four twenty seven to 33. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one would said, what do you seek or... Why are you talking with her? Now, remember, talking to a woman in public was frowned upon, and you were told not to do that. A married woman you were absolutely not supposed to talk to in public, uh, and they would generally wear a veil to indicate their married status. Now, this woman's not married, but she's living with a man, so was she dressed as a married woman or not? Well, we don't know. 
But there you go. Either way, on the top of the fact, of course, that she's a Samaritan, who you're not supposed to be talking to those icky Samaritans anyway. And why are we even in Samaria, Jesus? Because Jesus loves to break rules. He broke the rule when he walked through Samaria instead of going around it across the Jordan River. And now he's breaking some other rules by talking to this woman publicly. It's disgraceful. It's amazing. It's incredible. So the woman left her water jar and went into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, so the woman's out, for lack of a better term, evangelizing. She's sharing her testimony. That's what she's doing. I preached on this last Sunday. So if you want a good uh, sermon on this, I would suggest that you check out March um, 16th, March, May 16th, 2021, at the River Church website, riverchurchparker.com, and you can listen to that sermon there. It goes into a lot more detail than I can do right now. So, uh, meanwhile, the disciples are urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat, because they provided the food, because that's their job, right? But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So his disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Who's doing our job for us? Who's trying to get in? Did you bring him food that I didn't know about? Of course, this is the great example you see all through the Gospel of John. Jesus is speaking on a spiritual, metaphorical level very often. And the disciples and many times the Jews and the people that he's talking to are down here on the literal level. And so they, (laughs) you know, they just didn't get it. They were afraid to challenge him because he's the rabbi and they're not supposed to do that. Now in Mark chapter 2, verse 32, this is also interesting. It says, but they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Now I always wondered about that. I mean, Jesus, when you read him in the New Testament, can seem like kind of a scary dude sometimes. He was certainly to the point, I think you could say that. (laughs) <laughs> without any fear of contradiction. Um, and I, so I wondered, was it that? Was it uh, just showing respect? Well, yeah, but, but now that I know that, of course, disciples were not supposed to contradict their rabbi, then they would be very careful what they said to him because they did not normally want to be in an adversarial position, although Peter does that, remember, when he said, you will never be be that's never going to happen to you lord blah 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 so i mean it did happen jesus gave his disciples i think more latitude than your average jewish rabbi would have done so okay so now those two scripture passages i sort of added in for this episode so we'll go back to the part of the text which i've excised here it says we have a fascinating text that demonstrates what it means to be a disciple quote but jehoshaphat said is there no prophet of the Lord here that we might that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah, Second Kings three eleven. The prophet Elisha's greatness is demonstrated not by saying, Oh, look at these miracles that he did, this, that, blah, blah, blah. Nope. It's describing him as a disciple of Elijah the prophet. And the greatness of of Elisha's discipleship is shown in that he had the privilege to help Elijah wash his hands. Pretty mundane task, wouldn't you say? Can you even imagine? Can you even imagine? unless you're physically unable to do this or having difficulties. But assuming you're not, can you even imagine allowing someone to help you wash your hands? Pouring water over my hands as I... This was this was not, by the way, washing, you know, like we wash hands. This was a ritual thing Jews did. It did obviously clean their hands a little bit, but it was primarily the ritual that they would do. So they would rub their hands together as they poured water over it, and that was now you're symbolically ritually clean. That's what Elijah did. He held the pot and poured the water. That's being a disciple. Now, 
What about the rabbis? What were they supposed to be doing? According to the Babylonian Talmud, not, of course, uh, scripture and in no way binding upon Jesus, but it's still interesting to note. In turn, the duties of the rabbi were, first of all, to teach Torah. He would train his disciples to emulate him and even surpass him in knowledge and practice of the Torah. Torah, of course, the first five books of the Bible. The rabbi was obligated to protect his disciples from heresy and from sin. For this reason, the rabbi has the privilege to reprimand his disciples and judge their actions. Well, now we certainly see that with Jesus. He was constantly, you know, rebuking them and saying, come on, you guys, how could you miss this point? Come on, think, you know, wake up. I mean, that kind of thing was going on all the time with Jesus and his disciples. So there's no doubt that he certainly carried that forth. He also obviously was teaching them Torah, but not in the traditional way. And you'll notice that it says uh, that he he was to train his disciples to emulate him in knowledge and practice of the Torah. So when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, for example, and Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, who's he talking to? Well, if you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it says he went up on the mountain and to teach his disciples. So, that's why he does this. Because he's saying, this is what all these other guys are saying. But if you're going to follow me, here's what I'm saying. Boom. And then he drops the mic. Drops all kinds of bombs all over him, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount. Holy cow. Um, so that's what he did. And then when they would mess up or stuff, he would he would correct them and rebuke them or whatever the situation called for. Now, these instructions were taken very seriously by the Jewish community from the first century AD. And there are still some circles, probably my guess is probably, in, in, you know, the Orthodox Jews probably still take this fairly seriously up to this very day. For Jews, the issue of disciples is one of the most important issues in the preservation of Judaism and of the Jews themselves. Discipleship creates a chain and a continuum that ensures that the next generations will continue to be related to and influenced by the Torah that God gave Israel at Mount Sinai. Without disciples of Moses and then Joshua and then the prophets, there would be no Judaism today. And of course, you have probably heard people say the same thing for the Christian faith, and of course, it's true. If it wasn't for Jesus making disciples, and then, you know, guys like Paul had Timothy and Titus and other people, and then they had their, and on and on and on. You know, none of us would be here, and the world would be bereft of this podcast. Not that it would notice. (laughs) I'm not sure anyone would notice if this podcast disappeared today, but, except me, maybe. But, uh, yeah, that's how the faith is passed down. And it is something that was commonly understood by Jews in the time of Christ. But Jews were not the only people who had disciples. Now, of course, in the Greek world, and the Roman world, but more specifically in the Greek world, you had you know, people like Socrates and Plato and all those dudes, and they had disciples. Now, they, of course, they weren't called rabbis, but they were the leader, the master, the teacher, whatever you want to call it, and they had followers of them. So the Greek word in the New Testament for uh, disciple is, Math- is Matthias. It, I was always taught that this meant uh, a student, a learner. It's from the word uh, that means to learn. When it was translated, or when they translated the Bible into Latin, uh, it became the word discipleus, which means a scholar, interestingly enough. And there, right there, thusly, right there, we begin to get off track. Because remember what I said. Let me go back and read this again. Here we go. 
The object of discipleship, I'm going to make this bold so you can see it in the old show notes if you look them up at discipleup.org. The object of discipleship is to follow, emulate, copy, duplicate, and replicate your rabbi all while serving him. The object of discipleship is not to become a scholar. Not that that's a bad thing. It's fine to be a scholar. It's wonderful if you're a scholarly person. Great. Good for you. Within my own mental limitations <laughs> uh, and limitations of education and limitations of availability to go like to some of the world's best libraries, which are certainly not around Parker, Arizona, um, I try to be as scholarly, if you want to use that term, as I can, but I'm not a scholar. Most disciples of Jesus aren't going to be scholars because being a disciple is not being is not about being a scholar. It's about being a follower and a copier and an emulator and a duplicator of who Jesus is. Let that sink in. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was 13 years old when I got baptized. had no prior Bible knowledge at all, really. Um, when they... We, you know, we had a midweek Bible study, usually met in people's homes at least for a while. And I remember going and, and they would say something like, okay, let's look in our Bibles at Luke uh, 1412 or whatever. I didn't know what 1412 meant. And no one explained it to me for a while till finally, you know, someone did and I figured it out. So, oh, it's chapter 14, verse 12. So, because I tried the 1412, I tried finding page 1412 in my Bible, but <laughs> that didn't work. Um, so it was, I, you know, I mean, I was like nothing. I had nothing going on. So when I was told that the word disciple meant student, what do you think I thought of? Well, I thought of school, of course. What else are you going to think of, especially when you're in it? And so, in my mind, that's what a disciple was. Well, look, I was not in grade school, in high school. I was not an enthusiastic student. I was there because they made me go. I didn't really... I, I enjoyed some of it, but not most of it. And so, when they defined a disciple as student, I was just like, ugh. <laughs> you know... I I I I still remember that that feeling I had. I said that kind of that gut level negative uh, feeling when I first heard it. I don't think we should define the word disciple in the New Testament as student. I think that's not a good translation because being a disciple is not just about learning things. Now, it used to be, of course, schools existed to teach you facts and truth, and today they still do that, but a lot of them are also teaching other stuff, and I'm not going to get into all that jazz, but what being a disciple is about is, yes, you're learning the, the Word of God, but you're learning it for the sole and express purpose of then applying it to your life so that you can follow, emulate, copy, duplicate, and replicate Rabbi Jesus. That's what you're doing it for. That's why we learn. We do not learn just to accumulate knowledge and impress everybody with how smart we are. Because that's not, you know, first of all, that doesn't necessarily change your life at all. How many doctors have you heard of who were drug addicts? They knew all about it and they still fell into it. So knowledge alone is not enough. It, you have to have it. It's absolutely essential. But by itself, it's nothing. Knowledge alone is nothing. As Paul says, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. You've got to have that commitment and that love, or your knowledge doesn't really do you any good. Now, the word disciple is found in the Bible only in the four Gospels and the book of Acts. Now, it's a good Greek word. It was, used, it was in use from Herodotus on down. And it always means a pupil of someone in, con in contrast to a master or teacher. But again, not pupil in the way that we think of it. Uh, I'm quoting here from, uh, I don't remember, I don't have an example. I didn't, I didn't reference this, but it's one of the study books that I use, the word study books, Vincent or whoever, uh, Robertson. In all cases, it implies a person 
it implies that the person, the disciple, not only accepts the views of the teacher, but that he is also in practice an adherent. Hold on, I'm going to get a drink. My throat's getting raspy. Orange tangerine Mio. Good stuff. The disciple is a follower. Someone who adheres completely to the teachings of another. Making them his rule of life and conduct. So this is saying the same thing that I read to you earlier from Jewish sources. Let's just read that again. A disciple is a follower. Someone who adheres completely to the teachings of another, making them the rule of life, his rule of life and conduct. So in other words, a disciple is someone who hears the teachings of the master, reads them, studies them, comes to understand them, and then applies them to his or her life. If you're not doing that, you're not a disciple. Now, the word has several applications. In the widest sense, it refers to those who accept the teachings of anyone, but not only in belief, but in life. Thus, the disciples of John the Baptist, and I have some references you can look up. I'm not going to quote them here, but Matthew 9 and Luke 7 and John 3. And also the Pharisees, Matthew 22, Mark 2, Luke 5, and there were also disciples of Moses, John 9.28. But its most common use is to, des- to design in the New Testament, its most common use is to designate the adherence of Jesus. In the widest sense, uh, it is only it is the only name for Christ's followers in the Gospels, but especially the twelve apostles. It's used particularly of the twelve, so it's used of everybody out there that's following Jesus at any given moment. But it's also used in a in a narrower sense of the twelve who would become the apostles. Uh, so sometimes that can be a little confusing. You, so you have to do what you always have to do when you study the Bible, and that's look at the Context. If you thought context or said it before I did, congratulations. Now, in the book of Acts, after the death and ascension of Jesus, disciples are those who confess him as Messiah. Christians, that's a word that pops up in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 and verse 7, and Acts chapter 9, verse 36, are disciples. The disciples were called Christians, says in Antioch. Even half-instructed believers who had been baptized only with the baptism of John are called disciples in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. Now, the early Christians, very early, early Christians, they gave themselves a name. They gave the group a name, and it was probably taken when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They decided to call themselves the way. This is found often in the book of Acts. Here's a few examples. I've just picked three. You could pick more. Acts 9-2. And ask him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Acts 19-23. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. And Acts, oh, I forget, I've actually got two more, Acts 24.14 and Acts 24.22. But this I confess to you, according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I'll decide your case. So this term appeared to die out in favor of a new term that was given to the church as opposed to the ones which they themselves apparently chose for themselves. And of course, that is the word Christian. Now, Jesus never used the word Christian. He always used the word disciple. Think about that for a minute. Um, Everybody in the world, I think, or oh, well, not everybody, obviously, but almost everybody has heard of Christians. I mean, there are yeah, there are isolated tribes out there, and blah blah blah. But you know, most everybody knows that you're a Christian. I mean, that's the the universal term that's applied to Christ followers, whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Eastern Orthodox or whatever. But it's interesting that Jesus didn't use the term uh, at all. 
he used the term disciple. The first time that the word Christian is found in the Bible is in the book of Acts, Acts 11.26. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They were called Christians. And they were, and, and, and I think almost every Bible scholar agrees that the believers didn't think this name up themselves. It was applied to them. The early church had other names for themselves, such as disciples or the way or saints or brothers. The name Christian, which means belonging to Christ, appears to have been invented by those outside the church. It was most likely originally supposed to be a derogatory term. Only two other times does the word appear in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 26, verse 28, and in 1 Peter 4, 16. The idea that the term Christian was used as a pejorative finds some support in 1 Peter, because here's what it says, quote, However, if you suffer as Christians, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So it seems as though to the early Christians... The term Christian, you know, it really wasn't looked upon too favorably. Now that may seem strange to you, but it shouldn't. I remember way back, way back in the day, Shunny, back in the nineteen late 1960s and early 70s, you've all heard of the Jesus People Movement. If you don't know much about it, Google it. Or duck, duck, go it. That's the search engine I'm using now. Um, And you can read all about it. It was an amazing time. And people in this movement that used the term Jesus people, that was sort of the term that they would use. They would also use the word Christian, of course. Many people in the movement would also reference the way because they found that in their Bibles. But to the people uh, watching all this happen who were not believers, and this was primarily for younger people, so the younger people who weren't buying into this whole all this Jesus jazz, they came up with the term for the really on fire people. They were called Jesus freaks. It was not a compliment. <laughs> and in fact, it offended people I knew And I was actually called a Jesus freak a couple times, at least once, maybe twice. Once by a someone who was a very good friend of mine, uh, who I just adored. And boy, when she said that to me, that um, I told her I took it as a compliment. But honestly, I was disappointed, and uh, yeah, it kind of hurt my feelings a little bit because I knew it was not a compliment. Um, so. It's a similar kind of thing. And it's interesting how time can change that. Because if you remember, um, DC Talk came, I think it was DC Talk, came up with their album, Jesus Freak. So, you know, if people give you a name that's kind of an insult or a put down, you're the one who decides what to do with that name. You're the one who decides if you're going to just kind of hate it get all upset every time somebody says it, which is, of course, handing them the keys to your life. That's like saying, okay, now you know how to control me. Every time you say blah, blah, I'm going to freak out. And so now I get to control you because you're so dang sensitive. Or you could just say, (laughs) okay, uh, depending on how you define the word freak, for example, Jesus freak might be fairly accurate. If I'm really committed to him, if I'm in love with him, if he's number one in my life, if I'm dedicated to serving him and standing up for him, and even if I, you know, I said in love with him a minute, a second ago there, but it doesn't really matter how you feel. What matters is what you do. And if you believe and then you live the, or at least try to live like you believe, and if you stand firm and if you don't cave in and if you don't quit, then, you know, people, if they call me a Jesus freak, okay, so, you know, everybody's a freak about something. <laughs> um, goes back to the old Bob Dylan song, everybody's got to serve somebody. Yeah, well, that's true. 
Um, I remember we did a March for Jesus once over the absolute, uh, just vociferous um, disagreement of the leaders of the church, which I was going to at that time when I was in high school. It was the year after high school, I think, actually. Um, and they didn't like it, and they said we couldn't do it. So the church couldn't sponsor, but they couldn't stop me and a lot of people from going, and we did. And I carried a sign that said, I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? <laughs> now, this was considered clever and innovative in the 1960s. I don't know that I would do that now. In fact, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. But at the time, you know. And actually, that was doing the same thing. People say, you're crazy, you're foolish, you're in that to believe this, whatever. Okay, well, I'm going to be a fool for Christ, and he's going to change my life, and he's going to bless me and all this. And so... What are you, who who or what are you a fool for? Because I will stack up what God does in my life against whatever it is that your fool over will do in your life. Any day of the week, all day, any day. So I think that's what the early Christians did. Everybody picked it up, they rolled with it, and it was accurate, right? The belongers, followers of Christ, those who belong to Christ, whatever. However you're going to translate that. So it's not inaccurate. It was probably, they were probably laughing at them when they did it, but pretty soon that changed and they began to wear it as a badge of honor. Which is a great way, by the way, to emulate the master and turn the other cheek. Instead of striking back and arguing and jumping up and down and blah, blah, blah. It's okay. Okay. You're right, I, I do belong to Jesus. I, I I am a follower of his, and if you want to call me that, that's fine. Because <laughs> then, of course, it takes all the joy out of using it. If it doesn't, you know, if I'm going to throw a pejorative term at you, I want you to react strongly and negatively or get angry or get upset or cry or do something, right? If you don't do that, it kind of takes all the fun out of it. And so Christians took this term which was meant as an insult, and they flipped it around, and they used it all for the glory of God. And we're still with it today, folks. So there you go. So what is a disciple? A disciple is someone who takes the teachings of Jesus not just into his or her head to intellectually understand them. Of course you have to do that. But then tries to implant them deep in their hearts so that their very lives, the way, what they say and how they say it and the way they move and the way they act and what they do and how they do it and everything in their life is impacted and changed by the power and the presence of Jesus. That's a disciple, a copier, an emulator, a follower. So that's what a disciple is. little reminder, maybe you didn't know some of that. Maybe you did. I don't know. But um, hopefully you found this helpful today. Uh, I want to thank you for listening. And I want to ask you to please share this, if you could, on your social media, if you think it's worth sharing. If you don't, then don't. And if you think it's worthwhile, you might want to tell a few friends about the podcast because we could use more listeners. Lots more, quite frankly. And um, if you have any ideas on future topics or things you'd like to talk about, if you have questions about the Bible or, you know, what the Bible teaches in terms of, like, how do we apply it in certain areas or whatever, get a hold of me. You can email me, louie, L-O-U-I-E, at discipleup.org. Or you can go to the Facebook page, facebook.com slash discipleup, leave a comment there. Just remember, the comments on Facebook are open to the public. So if you want to talk to me privately, email me. There you go. So that is going to do it for today. Please check out DiscipleUp.org and all the good stuff that's there. And until next time, God bless you. Thanks for listening. And remember that every time is a good time to Disciple Up. Thanks so long. 
Cyber Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast, is written, produced, directed, in as much as there's any direction to this thing at all, edited every once in a while, and paid for by Louis. It's his personal ministry, and it's not connected to Christchurch on the River. CCR does not sponsor, pay for, or necessarily approve the content found therein. The theme music for Disciple Up is Hot Wheels by Varensky. Yes, Louis actually paid for the rights to this very cool piece of music, so don't worry, and please call off the lawyers, as he's busy enough without having to deal with all that. All opinions expressed during Disciple Up are Louis and Louis alone. They do not necessarily represent those of our sponsor, the Lord Jesus Christ. However, where the opinions, thoughts, impressions, and feelings shared are in line with God's word and faithfully represent what our Lord says in his holy word, the Bible, then they are representative of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're wondering how the heck you're supposed to know this, remember, God tells you to test all things. Hold on to the truth. It's up to you to do the due diligence that God commands, so do it. Don't whine about it, and don't complain about how hard it is, don't blame me for it. Disciple Up, and do what you know you're supposed to do. If you'd like to know more about Louis or Disciple Up, please go to discipleup.org and check out everything you find there. Or not, it's completely up to you. Disciple Up, the Empowering Disciples podcast will, God willing, publish an episode every week covering different areas of concern to disciples of Jesus. If that's important to you, then please subscribe on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, or another one of the many podcast aggregators available to you. If it's not, then don't. If you'd like to get in touch, please email Louie at louie at discipleup.org. God bless you.